Good morning. You get me this morning. I'm the preacher. Is anybody easily offended? Hey, we're in James chapter 3 today. Uh, are you blondes thick, thick skinned this morning? I could tell a little blonde thing. I haven't done it for years. Just one. Yeah, the, the blonde went into the shoe store and tried on a pair of shoes. Clerk said, how they fit? She said, they're real pretty, uh, they fit really tight. And uh, the clerk looked down there and saw the, what was wrong. And so he said, well, if you try, why don't you try pulling out the tongue, see how they feel. He said, they feel the same way. <laughs> That's really sick, isn't it? <laughs> That's really bad. I'm sorry I did that. <laughs> hey, would you, would you sing uh, 126 with me? It's a hymn that is so rich in words, and I think with it being Thanksgiving, it's so easy to look at things that are not good and forget to count our blessings. 126. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Come on. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God had done. And see, Lord, I'm really hard to follow because I'm old. So you're doing pretty good, though. I'm telling you, most people can't even, I'm all over everywhere. So I change tempo, key in the middle and everything like that. So while I do that, just count your blessings that I don't lead that often, okay? All right, verse 3. Verse 3, when you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy your reward in heaven or your home. On the course, count, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God had done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Here we go, watch me. Count your many blessings, see what God had done. Every servant, every church sings that a little different, and I'm the one that sings it right. So all those other people, and I don't mean that. I mean that in the most loving, gracious way. With my speech season was sought since I'm preaching on the tongue today. Well, we're on chapter three, the chapter nobody really wants to be on because it convicts everybody. I have three simple thoughts this morning. First off, that to control the tongue is futile effort to do it in yourself. You're never going to do it. You can't do it. I can't do it. We can't just decide. I can get up here and tell you how horrible it is to say certain things and you're not going to change yourself. The second thing is the effect of a tongue that's out of control. It's like a fire, like a little spark. It might be, and it's just like a, like a forest fire, man. And think about it back then. They, had, they used to make a lot of fires and cook fish, you know. They must have known what it was to have a forest fire. James must have because he talks about it like a forest fire. And boy, the tongue can really burn things up and hurt and burn a lot of people. They say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's the biggest lie I ever told. Words hurt deeply. And the last thing is the, after a fire effect, is the faith emphasis. The emphasis that we are going to speak words that please God, bless God, and bless others. We need to have God inside us do that because in me is no good thing. Listen, I'm born after the first Adam who all people brought sin forth. You see it in my little granddaughter. She's precious as can be. I haven't seen it yet, but I'll guarantee you she's selfish by nature. Jeremiah says the, the heart of a man is wicked, and only Jesus can change it. When I was a young man, 
I remember I didn't listen to anything. I was squirrely. I was all over everywhere, you know, and I, I, I was that kid in Sunday school that didn't listen, didn't learn anything, didn't know anything. I didn't listen in VBS. I was jittery. I was talking. I was cutting up. I was being a clown and, you know, and, and the Lord's paying me back in my Wednesday fifth grade class right now with some of your children. <laughs> Not you. you. You were perfect, Chloe, in there. I remember you. You were perfect. But anyway, uh, I remember at the end of just an invitation, we started singing a song, into my heart, come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And he came into my heart. I know he came into my heart, he touched my heart. For the first time I knew God loved me and I knew God was with me and instead of talking to my dog, I talked to God and I knew he heard me and he's been with me and I've failed him many times, but he's picked me up. I've fallen, he's picked me up. I've shot my mouth off, he's beat me across the head. Well, convicted me, and I asked him to forgive me. And let me ask you a question. Anybody here right now know that right now, you already know, if you think about the words over the past week, that you probably said something that you shouldn't have said. Raise your hand. Did you know that you can say things? Did you know that you can say things without saying things? You can say things with looks body language, and you can say something that in itself isn't bad, but the tone, like, this is okay, sure, or sure, sure, right, and now you got to kind of understand things so you don't get offended, because I get offended at teenagers when I get done with my sermon, and they say, that was sick, Pastor, that was sick. I figured out that meant it was good. <laughs> right? That was sick. You know, yeah, they, they change words on you. You're just getting old, and you know, I'm just going to get me a wig and pretend I understand what they're talking about because they're from Mars and I'm from Venus or somewhere else. I don't know where they're from. And you know, words matter. That's the title, words matter. And uh, did you know that words matter whether they're written or spoken? You know, social media is a, it can be a horrible thing or a great thing. Now, I'm just give you, tell you something. Listen carefully and just try to open your heart to this truth. If I post something that's an opinion of mine, like I'm, I'm on the news or I'm in the newspaper or I'm on an outlet that the whole world can see, and I post something, that's an opinion that someone else has a different opinion of, and I may post it with the kindest of heart to try to pass on my viewpoint and my perspective, but when you don't, you're not speaking it out of relationship to someone, you just put it there in words, whoever has that same opinion you have, their attitude, in other words, they added to it words that maybe you say this, but other people have said this and these things, and called people names and accused people and were mean-spirited and they posted the same thing you're posting, you get, people will read that through the filters that they've been hurt by and read you into the other person that was at nasty and ugly whether you meant to be or not. And can I tell you something else? Is our calling to get on a social media site and correct the world? It's to win people to Jesus. And if people see your post and they disagree with you and it has nothing to do with Jesus, you just shut them out in your voice and you'll never influence them toward Jesus. Are you with me? I have never posted anything hurtful ever, always building up. And I'm asking you to pray or fully consider before you start copy someone else's post, stick something on there. Even if it's a point of someone making and they're making a speech and you copy it and you put it on your page, even, no matter what it is, I'm telling you, it doesn't do any good. You're not going to change anybody's mind. Flow out of relationship. That thing is not relationship built because every person that you're a friend of, unless you know how to set the settings better than I do, they read it, and the people that you're friends, their friends, and other people, I got people posting on things I put, I'm going, who's that, who's that? Well they, must, well, they got this friend in common, but they're just posting all, let me just tell you, those words are out there, they have no inflection, they don't know your heart, 
you're not in relationship, they don't understand where you're coming from, it's not gonna change anybody's mind. Am I okay? I, don't, I said something a couple of weeks ago and I saw five families get up and leave. I, I think they all had to go to the bathroom at once. Surely wasn't what I said. That's, I, was, I was only teasing about that. I didn't see that happen. But every once in a while, people have to leave and I'll say something. It'll be right when I say something I think's offensive. And later I'll check with them. In fact, I called someone who I saw leave early. They said, oh, no, Pastor, you did a great job. We just had to go a little early. I'm sorry I made you feel that. I said, yeah, I thought you thought didn't like what I had to say. But you know what? I'm going to still say what I have to say, but sometimes it's not what I say, but how I say it. Did you know even preaching, you can preach the truth, but the tone, the heart, can either block it or help people receive it. You with me? Let your speech be seasoned with grace, Paul says. With grace. Well, uh, there's different ways we can use our words. In a, in, in a point of making this with the social media, 550 years ago, it's almost like this guy knew that we were going to have social media. How many of you ever heard of the book, The Imitation of Christ? It's by Thomas Kempis. Very famous book published 550 years ago, and it's almost like they had Facebook back then or other social media. Here's what he says, we must not trust every word of others or every feeling within ourselves, but most cautiously and patiently try each matter, whether it is of God. Sadly, we're so weak and that we find it easier to believe and speak evil of others than good. But those who are perfect do not believe every word of gossip, for they know man's weakness, that it is prone to evil, this is great wisdom, to not be hasty in action or stubborn in our own opinions. A part of this wisdom also is not to believe every word we hear, nor to tell others all that we hear, even though we may believe it. Pastor Hawkins preached out of James chapter 119 about being swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The devil is a liar. And he lies to you and he whispers to you about other people to cause division. The devil is a divider and God is a uniter. Paul says in every one of his books to defend the unity of the faith. But the devil wants us to get so worked up about things that aren't gonna change anybody that we forget to really get passionate about that one thing that will change everybody and that's Jesus in their heart. Now, with your words, I'm gonna contrast Oh, and I love it. Uh, Ron Alexander said, I'm a big fish guy. I said, what do you mean? He says, I throw the little fish away and I keep the big fish. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, a lot of things don't matter. They're just little incidents. So what? It offends me a little bit. So what? It's just a little minor thing. I just let it go. Don't make a big, don't make a mountain out of a mel hill, in other words. You know, if it's a big, big deal, it's a big deal. But otherwise, there's a lot of things that aren't. They're just little fish. Just throw them back in. Let it go. Let them go. Throw the fish back. Let them go. So here's the deal. And I, I want you to know that I've probably, whether it was intentional or not, failed in every one of these ways, but I want you to, to examine your heart. With our words, we can, uh, first off, let me mention this. My wife always listens to others and asks questions. She cares about other people. She's merciful. And what I, I observe is that most people want to talk about themselves. In fact, salesmen say, if you want to sell something, ask a lot of questions because everybody wants to talk about themselves. So if you want to use your words, use your words to understand and find the heart of a person, to know the person, to care about the person, to let them know they're valued and that they're loved and you care about them as people. That's number one. That's free. It's not even part of the text, really. Second thing is we can use our words to accuse, to accuse others of motive, accuse them of something that they meant to do and purpose and maybe they didn't and to alienate people. Or we can use our words to affirm them and love, the Bible says, believes the best, instead of accusing, affirm them and draw near to them, be close to them. We can use our words to attack and to bully, and just because you believe in truth doesn't mean you use a tone that's bullying, and the words you choose that's bullying are that attack something that you differ, dis disagree with, you can use your words to attack or bully or reassure and defend. You can use your words to condemn and criticize or you can use your words to compliment, to congratulate 
and to celebrate. You can use your words to curse or bless, to discourage or encourage, to gossip or to protect and promote. I wanna talk about gossip. What is gossip? Gossip isn't just spreading something that isn't true. Gossip is telling anything that's hurtful to anyone else, to anybody else, unless that person is a part of the solution. So if I'm just spreading information, even though it's true, oh, so-and-so, did you hear they're, they're with child and they're not married? Oh, so-and-so, did you hear they're getting divorced? Oh, so-and-so, did you hear this, did you hear that? Well, it might be true, it might be factual, but why are you telling that person? Are they a part of the solution? You know, we need to guard our tongue, and it's one thing I'm so proud of most of you about that you just don't do that, and just don't tell things unless the person's a part of the solution. Let it be private and love them. We don't know all the details. Love them where they are. You see, gossip uh, is not whether it's false or true. It, you gossip even if it's true, if you're sharing it and it's hurtful to someone, it puts them down or makes them feel bad, or, or sharing something. That, that makes people look down on them or negative because the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. So we're not to gossip but protect and build up and promote people. See the good that's still there. They made a mistake. See the good, promote them. Don't beat them over the head with words. We can hate with words or we can love with words. We can be hurtful and divisive or helpful and healing we can insult and intimidate, or we can inspire with our words. We can offend and put down, or we can be quick to admit wrong or to apologize. Even if you had no wrong, you're sorry you hurt their feelings because that wasn't your heart, and you can build up. You can ridicule, or you can bring relief. You can put shame and guilt, or you can words of forgiveness. You can slander with your words or strengthen the person and speak highly of them. Sincerely, something that's good, and I have never met a person that wasn't something good about. It's what you're looking at. You can tear down and belittle or build up and encourage you. You can be demanding or you can be appreciative. Waiters and waitresses know this, the difference between a demander and an appreciator. You can be, did I say negative and positive? Negative people with words, positive people with words. The Hawkeyes will never beat Michigan. No way. Or, hey, they got a chance, they're playing the game, we might win, let's go cheer. Did they beat them? <laughs> Did they win yesterday? Whoa, you guys are happy, I bet the offering's good today. I know cyclones were given because, man, that was definitely God. That was the Holy Spirit all over that field. <laughs> I have no love for Texas Longhorns. Sorry if you're a Longhorn fan. You can complain or give thanks. You can be sarcastic or sincere. You can be vulgar or holy. You can be defensive or admitting, admission. You can speak truth or you can speak lies. Did you know that Satan, he, he wants people to hurt people. He wants you to be hurt and other people to be hurt. And you know he lies. In fact, he lied, the first lie he told was to break up God and Adam's relationship, Adam and Eve and God. He lied to him. You know what he lied, you know what he whispered? He says, what, God say that? He said, hey, he said he knows if you'd eat of that tree, you'd be like a little God. He lied, got him to eat that tree. Did you know that he whispers against others their motives? He whispers they think that they're better than you. He whispers they intentionally don't like you. They ignored you. You know, they think you're stupid. They think this or that. You see what I'm talking about? I mean, the devil's all the time putting thoughts in your head to break relationships down. And you know, speaking the truth matters. You know why I tell you all the time that in the foyer, when I'm out there, I'm when there's a lot of people, I see everyone and see nobody. And I have a hard time talking to one person with a bunch of people around. I'm just no good at it. I just can't focus. 
until I see someone really hurting or I've been prayed for, they just had cancer, they're going through a divorce, or I've been working with them and I want to see them know Jesus, and suddenly everybody else disappears, the light is on them, and I'll walk right by you. But I'm telling you, I'll defend my heart. I would never intentionally ignore or walk by any person except Susan. I brought you eggs and sausage yesterday, so you can just forgive me for that one, okay? <laughs> so, the devil lies. Why? Because he, he wants to hurt people. Why? Because hurt people have anger. They've been hit with a rock. No matter where it is, it could be the devil. It may not be intentional, maybe no one, but they get hurt, and hurt people hurt other people. And how, there's every one of you have hurt someone and you didn't mean to. You may or may not know it, but you probably have. And good people hurt people. That doesn't mean they're bad people. It means they're people, imperfect. And we've, we've all hurt someone, and, but the difference of a Christian is Christians forgive and believe the best in love. And, uh, and, and, and so let us remember that and not let the devil play games with us and let's keep on track. So this morning we read James chapter three, and this is going to, the rest of it's pretty short, but one, one to five, we'll start there. And the point being futile effort to ever tame your tongue. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Perhaps that's from God, but I know it's from man. Because don't you expect more from the person telling the truth like they ought to live up to it or you call them a hypocrite quickly? But how many of you know I prepare these messages and already I'm convicted and I know I'm guilty and I'm up here telling you all this and you're sitting there knowing, yeah, he did this and this and this and you know it. So it's true. We need to be careful. Do our very best to let God's spirit help us. But he says, because we know that those that teach will be judged more strictly. Look at this. We all, look at that. We who? All. All, all, all stumble in many ways. Some ways, a way, no, many ways. We're human folks. <laughs> and if anyone is never at fault in what he says with his words, with his tongue, he never sins with his tongue, he's a perfect man able to keep his whole body in check. That's how hard it is to control this mouth of ours. When we put bits in the horse, mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take a ship by, for example. Although they're large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Someone told me after the first service that a great big ship, that rudder, it takes them five miles to turn all the way around because it moves so slowly. And maybe it'll take you five miles of meditation and filling up of Jesus and more fresh water in your spirit before you can get control of that little rudder right there and get, it, get your ship of your words turned around. And so, likewise, the rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go, okay, likewise, the, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what great force is set on fire by a small spark. Look at verse 7. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Man can tame wild animals, but we can't on our own tame this tongue. You're just not going to. But guess who can? Jesus. Jesus can. But it's a futile effort to try. We're not going to succeed. And we need to know that the only answer is more of Jesus. The second thought is it has a fiery effect. Look at verse 5 again. It says, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. You know, they used to, they used to use fires to cook their fish with out in public, I'm sure in the woods. So I'm sure James had seen and they had experienced big forest fires, but they didn't have fire departments to call back then or planes to put it out. And it's just a little spark. The tongue is like that. It says in verse six, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. This is the most evil member right here, this tongue, what we say. It's a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person. It sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself, is, and itself, and is itself set on fire by hell. In other words, the devil influences us to say things that are wrong. He's whispering. He's involved. See, he's the liar, the father of liars. The spirit is truth. 
and Jesus is truth. And the truth God will give us and reveal to us and speak to us, but so many times we get caught up listening to the devil and his thoughts he places in our minds and are listening to our own thoughts based upon hurts from the past that we haven't forgiven and insecurities and feeling guilty ourselves and somehow placing on others the very the very uh, weakness that we have, assuming because we have the weakness, they have the weakness, and therefore we accuse them. How I many you know what I'm talking about? Then, it says all kinds of birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Okay, so it's a fiery effect. Guys, it has a big deal. You know, we need to hold each other accountable. And I, I bless you and ask you to pay close attention to my words. One of the things that always causes problems in churches is when pastors get hurt and they begin to attack a person instead of listen to a person. You hear what I'm saying? Get defensive. Leaders, whether you're a pastor, deacon, or whatever, a leader in the church, leaders need to be the example of humility. And whether the person actually meant to do anything that hurt you, they hurt you, they hurt you. It didn't matter if they meant to or not. And the appropriate response is, I'm so sorry I hurt you. That was not my heart. Please forgive me. Help me understand. And then be more careful. Because we, communication is not what we say, but what we hear. That's what I was talking about on Facebook. And you don't even have a tone there. You understand what I'm saying? Everybody with me? Y'all want to go home now because I'm, I'm getting tired of preaching. Okay, just a little bit more, okay? The best stuff is yet to come. But it does have a fiery effect, guys. I'm gonna tell you what. You gotta be careful because people go to talking and get the talking and they start getting the talking and then these people get against these people and these people, you know, and just, it just goes. Just destroys families. I know families that they can't even get along with their children or grand, they just destroyed each other. Because why? Because they, the Christians aren't like Jesus, aren't like God. God is gracious, merciful, loving, Believes the best, forgiving, kind, gentle, patient, long-suffering. Amen? Are you with me? All right. The final thing is, is a futile effort to change ourselves. We're never going to tame our own tongue. The effect, if we don't, is horrible. It's like a fire out of control, and it just does damage everywhere. And the emphasis, number three, is faith emphasis, because the answer is faith. So verse seven, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Now talk about a spring. It talks about the Holy Spirit when you come up and the baptism and the Holy Spirit and you have a spiritual language. It comes from the soul, from the well of your body like a spring into a river and it flows out. I'm telling you, when it talks about the spring here, it's talking about the well of what, what are you putting in the well. We tell our fifth graders, everything you see and everything you hear and all your friends are pouring stuff in your well. You get a dead skunk in your well, you gotta have a lot of fresh water to flush it out. You get exposed to something, whether you meant to or not, you see it, you hear it, whatever conversation attitudes that are passed on, no matter where you're getting it from, it's all affecting your well or your heart. You understand that? And so if it's affecting it, what's the antidote? The antidote is truth, and God's spirit, the spirit of the Lord changes us. Remember our heart, Jeremiah said, is desperately wicked. And only Jesus can change the heart. Jesus has to be there. And then the Holy Spirit has to do the work. He's the one that does the work to help us. And so it goes on, it says, notice, notice there at the end, it says, can a fig tree, verse 12, bear olives? I mean, you're, you're getting the fruit of what you put in here. I had a teacher that I don't remember anything he said because it's so rare that I ever listened to anything growing up. I mean, it didn't, especially certain subjects. I know you like science, so I don't want to offend anybody who likes science. I know you love science, but I hated science. Uh, who cares how it works? I'm just going out here in the sunshine. I don't care what's going on up there. Just, 
Give me a ball. (laughs) But the thing of it is, is the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. And and the the, the very nature of a tree, it's going to bear what we put in there. And this teacher gave this example. He said, you know, you're like, a, you're like somebody coming and punch you like a punching bag. Whatever you put in there, it comes out when you get hit. And he said, you're either going to have honey spill out or acid. And acid, you know what it does to metal and everything? It just corrodes it. It just ruins it. And so whatever you're putting into your life, when you get hit, when it's not easy, when your enemy comes against you, when they say ugly things against you instead of like, Jesus taught in the Beatitudes when they revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Be rejoiced and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. Instead of rejoicing, instead of love, instead of turning the other cheek, instead of going the extra mile, instead of praying for them who use you, what pours out? Acid. Because you're full of self and bitterness and flesh and it may not that you're doing a lot of evil stuff, but the absence of daily water And bread of the Spirit into your heart will leave you void of the honey of the Spirit of God and the love of God. And so when something hits you, what comes out is not pretty unless you filled yourself. And here's the thing, you're going to get stuff that's negative coming at you all the time. You can't avoid it. Let me just tell you, quit watching the news so much. That stuff just feels, it's like pouring the worst thing you can imagine into your well. So you have to get a whole bunch of Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Word, the water of the Word, the washing of the water of the Word, the Bible says, is the sanctification process, which is the filling of the process to get Jesus' Spirit in you and His truth in you. To, it, it, it just, it's just like any, like just picture a water well. You put stuff in it, you got to put a lot of fresh water to cleanse it. We got to keep coming to Jesus and the Holy Spirit to fill us up. That's the answer. It's a faith emphasis. We're not saved by works. Our faith shows, our faith, so that we know, Pastor Jeff said, no, we're saved. But our works show we're saved. And we can say we're saved with our words. But what comes up out of us and out of our mouth ought to be an indication to what's down in here. And we need a little more spirit. We need a little more truth. We need a little more love. We need a little more fruit so that the fig tree bears figs and the grapevine bears grapes. This is the words of Jesus. Now, James is a half-brother of Jesus, and I think he actually said it nicer than Jesus. Matthew 12. Mark it in your notes. Right before this, the verses before it, it's talking about the sin against the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus isn't here. It's the work of the Spirit that brings forth what kind of tree we are. Remember, what is the, it's the fruit of the what? Spirit. A fig tree, figs, a grapevine should be bearing grapes. If it's not, then evidently the tree is wrong or something's messed up. That's what James said. Now watch what Jesus says in verse 33 of Matthew 12. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Now he's talking to the religious leaders. You brood of vipers. For young people, that's a snake. You snake. How can you or evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. There it is. Whatever's in your heart. Now the heart is mine. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. But it's also the passion center, the fire center. What is your passion? Is it God? Is it his spirit? It is his word because you're gonna, you're gonna live for and fill yourself with your passion. If it's sports, that's all you think about. Out of the abundance of the heart or the overflow of the heart, the mouth is speaking. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give account. Watch this, this is scary, guys. I hate Jesus saying this. Lord, forgive us. I, I tell you, the men will have given account of the day of judgment for every careless word they've spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted. Or you will be found innocent. Or by your words you will be condemned. Words matter. Will you bow your head with me? The answer is Jesus in your heart, folks. 
and more of Jesus, more of God. You see, does your mouth immediately go to praise and encouragement, blessing man and worshiping Jesus? Is your heart, is your heart to sing praise to God, to give glory to God? See, it's easy to become religious. We like to sing songs and we sing them. At the moment, we mean that. And your heart wants to do right. But the bottom line is, if we don't take time to fill our, our reservoir with fresh water, our water gets stale and the junk in the world get down in our well and out of our well comes words that are just not what God is pleasing to God. Everybody get what I'm saying? Did you just hear that? Jesus needs to be in there. The true religion is relationship. It's Christ within the hope of glory. It's Jesus isn't on earth anymore physically. He is here by his spirit and he comes in our minds and our hearts and he fills us with so much love that that fruit is just so so natural, just grows on the tree of faith. It's the result. It's the works of righteousness. It's the fruit of the Spirit, and it affects our words. Let the Holy Spirit urge you to run to Jesus. You're here this morning, and you say, I've never asked Jesus into my heart, and I, or I've asked him, and I think I'm saved, but boy, I need more of Jesus deep down in my soul and his Spirit to pour more love and kindness and patience and gentleness and graciousness and forgiveness and mercy into my heart. I just need Jesus, his whole love to be like, I, I just need to be like him more. And you hear and you say, I just really need Jesus in my heart. I need his spirit. I need more of him. Any of that. Would you just, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just raise your hand and say, here I am. I need more of Jesus. I need his fruit. I need more of Jesus. I need Jesus to forgive my sin. I need Jesus to come into my heart. And I don't care what you're praying for this morning. Whatever you're raising your hand for. It may be you've walked with God many years and you used to be closer, but right now you just find yourself and your words not pleasing to God. I'm telling you, Jesus wants to change that. He wants to pour fresh living water through you. His spirit and help you be a person of praise and not a person of criticism, a person that blesses and not curses, a person that loves and doesn't judge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.